uh, we have this section uh, on uh, the ritual and the uh, dimension and uh, uh, the performance, the ritual and performance and the colonization uh, in with different aspects that we are going to cover up. Uh, we have a program of three speeches. Uh, first, um, my speech, uh, which is uh, on the ritual, the popular and political dimension, uh, touching upon uh, nomadism and uh, and uh, viral drama. So, uh, are you there, uh, Lania? Yeah, Rania, you are there? Yes. That's very good. I cannot see you. Maybe I see you. No, yeah, no, I can see you. Yeah, so uh, you heard my presentation. Uh, uh, I could say something more. Uh, uh, Rania is a freelance critic and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of, uh, directing. Uh, she has a background in uh, theater studies and media studies in, at the University of Bergen. Uh, Norway uh, and uh, Christian uh, Tongo is uh, based in Yaoundé as a performance artist. He's running a festival every year or every second year, uh, uh, representing a very dynamic uh, milieu of performance art in, in Cameroon and uh, also a, a great traveler of the world. Uh, and he uh, has been in Norway in a festival some couple of years ago. Well, uh, um, I am glad we can combine this South-North axis, uh, which I appreciate myself very much. Um, the South-North axis uh, uh, is very interesting. Uh, uh, I wrote one, an, an article on non-bandism, which was immediately taken from some artists in Africa and read the illustrations were from the savanna instead of from the Arctic, which uh, was a very nice uh, uh, gest gesture, which, which made me sure that these perspectives are very relevant. Uh, for, for this speech, no, uh, I want to start a little bit uh, theoretically, uh, uh, speaking about uh, the, the question of uh, dialogic spaces. Uh, uh, from art as ritual to art as uh, uh, as, as as dialogue, uh, and I, I I can start mentioning that there was a, a Soviet Lithuanian philosopher, Grigory Pomeranz is his name, who uh, in the uh, who spoke of, spoke was a specialist in Dostoevsky and the polyphonic uh, aspects of the Russian writer uh, Dostoevsky. And he used his uh, work on Dostoevsky to develop uh, a theory on, on the arts uh, and the relationship between art and, and uh, the shamanistic and the ritual and the polyphonic, uh, which is very high, highly relevant. He lived uh, in the 19... Well, he died some very few years ago. He was in the 1950s a uh, librarian of the secret library of Stalin in Moscow. Uh, but his origin was uh, from Lithuania. He was a Jewish Lithuanian philosopher. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, way of philosophizing on uh, on space and uh, and dialogue uh, is, in my mind, very relevant to understand uh, uh, the situation today, the situation in visual arts. Uh, where the concepts of uh, visual arts and performance, uh, of course, uh, and theater, uh, uh, where the, the concepts of landscapes and, uh, and spaces reflects the individual gaze and standpoint. Uh, such spaces and interiors, like interior, the, the, the inside of the experience or the outside, can be uh, metaphorically expressed uh, and uh, transferred into abstract and figurative uh, uh, images. We speak, can speak about a metaphorical gaze that can be used in art and science as a means to apprehend both cultural and personal identities and memories in, in social and political sense. Uh, the theatrical gaze uh, 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 is a gaze from the outside which looks and conceptualizes 
uh, from a personal uh, point the what is going on in the the, the, the in this uh, uh, process of transference of images and, and uh, metaphors. The normative uh, construction of meaning, as we know from classical drama, has in a way proved insufficient for comprehension in both uh, artistic and scientific senses. Uh, so uh, we more and more work on the uh, contextual, con implementing contextual factors, uh, that influence the development of art and theater in, in a way that transforms the marginalized into an expression of a decentralized and nomadic comprehension. A decentralized and nomadic comprehension. Uh, so uh, uh, visual art and performance is a matter of various personal approaches, creating a break with what we could call mainstream, or mainstream thought or the mainstream orientation. And this kind of break, which is very relevant to, uh, to uh, what used to be spoken about as the marginal, which you know, more and more the marginal is getting uh, more and more in the center, from margins to the center, as a scientific book was called. Uh, I used to speak about an artistic post-mainstream, which I have uh, defined in some articles also published on the INST uh, um, website, a periodical trans, which you can find on the net. Um, so uh, this post mainstream is uh, an expression of liberation from centralized thinking and meaning uh, construction capable of accommodating marginality. Uh, the dissolution of centralized thinking is hereby is thereby an outcome that that allows space to wander freely nomadically in the sense of landscape like uh, you know term nomad nomadic used in a metaphoric way but which can be also applied very concretely like the, the artist who is nomadic working nomadic in different countries uh, at the same time as we have a concrete nomadism with people living in, in nomadic lifestyles following their uh, their livestock, their animals, and uh, and herding them, which is the traditional or classical uh, definition of nomadic. Uh, so uh, uh, when we reflect on this uh, uh, nomadic situation, we can also touch upon uh, the question of legends, folk, folk tales, and uh, and. Uh, uh, performative expressions that are related to rituals uh, in the sense of uh, uh, ritual of a religious kind as well as rituals of a, of a social kind which is uh, a kind of broad uh, uh, backdrop also for, for uh, African art. So hybrid expressions merge various artistic genres or various historically distinct artistic periods and contribute uh, to an experience of art uh, that is more open than we could hitherto have imagined. Landscapes uh, and interiors become meaningful as loki or places of exposed materiality in the sense of uh, the, the, the material you make performance from. And there are, of course, some historical roots of this. Uh, which can be found in the Polish theater artist Jerzy Grotowski, who claimed that theater should be poor, it should renounce on outward technical effects. Uh, Antonin Artaud, the French versionary of theater, sought to place theater's visual and oral means of expression on an equal footing, leaving the dramatic text away. Um, and uh, Grotowski, on his side, uh, claimed a zero-point position by emphasizing the poverty of theater, which was a kind of movement uh, uh, also expanding into visual art, the, the, uh, Arte Povera, as they spoke about it in Italy, uh, the, the poor theater, uh, the poor art, which is not poor in the sense of not uh, having a means, well, maybe it can be discussed what, in what sense we can perceive of the poor, uh, but it has to do with zero point and the, the doing with the, with the more simpler means 
uh, of, uh, uh, of that can be used to create art, that art does not need all this technology, uh, which uh, uh, is, was to Jerzy Grotowski the rich theater, which he in a way blamed for taking away the intention of the audience, like, uh, uh, like the consuming culture. So this idea of the poor was in opposition to consuming culture uh, and the great show, as also uh, uh, Guy Debord, the French situationist thinker, spoke about as uh, the spectacle, the theater of the spectacle, which uh, uh, is uh, also very interesting. But uh, anyhow, uh, 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 Artois asked for a theater less based in language or speech, but more in physical expression and situation. And this situation is uh, thing is also very re relevant today. Uh, and uh, that's and that's as, 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 as an old spring for uh, for uh, working on on uh, on new forms of theater, which should do without necessary uh, need the technology. Uh, let me advance to the question of the of the. Of, uh, of the cultural uh, clashes towards decolonization. Um, so uh, we, we can we can take the, uh, uh, the 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 Arctic drama, the Arctic theater, an example for uh, uh, approaches into performativity, which connects to the nomadic uh, situation. Uh, the, the Arctic uh, uh, desert as a site for non-orientable uh, expressions in the sense of you have to find your own traces in the landscape and your own expressions in the, in the landscapes. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, there is a connection there in my mind uh, between the, the far north and, and the south. Uh, uh, and this came to an expression in the concept of, of uh, in the concept of uh, spiral dramaturgy, uh, which was developed by the Danish philosopher, Danish Greenlandic philosopher Ulla Rium, uh, who spoke about uh, 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 the circular uh, uh, or spiral of a nomadic storytelling kind. Uh, which is uh, would which would break away from the classical European dramaturgy based in the Aristotelian thinking, and uh, and one can find many examples of this spiral uh, storytelling in performative works uh, in the traditions or the new uh, more recent ways of making theater productions in this style. Uh, that we can find in in different Sami companies, and also in Greenlandic theater. So, uh, and and the topics that would be dealt with in this uh, uh, spiral and nomadic tradition uh, would be uh, topics like nomadism versus industrialization and urbanization, uh, and the conflicts that would create, uh, and. Um, there were storytelling festivals organized, like the Ridu Ridu festival in, in Troms, in northern Norway, or uh, workshops organized by um, by by Scandinavian and nomadic uh, oriented artists and thinkers uh, in performance work. Uh, and I think it's uh, interesting to also to mention that uh, our friend here, Christian, uh, once gave a workshop with Greenlandic actors in Copenhagen. So, uh, so this is the uh, South North interaction, which is uh, connecting the, the Arctic and the, and the, and the South of uh, the Savannah in the, in Western Africa, if one may say so. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, in a way, the backdrop for for uh, me wanting to invite uh, this to this section, both Rania Broad and Christiane Tongo. So I want us to proceed uh, uh, to uh, uh, first uh, uh, 
Rania Brut, uh, uh, giving uh, your presentation, the model of the theater, uh, and which is related to to Morocco uh, or the Maghreb. Theory. Yes, that's correct. Oh. Connected to Morocco, yes. Yeah, so please, uh, uh, you have your 20 minutes. Uh, and. Thank you. Thank you, Knutova. Um, my name is Rania Brud. I am born and raised in Norway by origin from Morocco. So I will just jump right into it. Between 4,000 and 2,000 years before the Common Era, nomadic Amazilian people were the first to settle in Morocco. Oral and performative traditions can be dated back to the beginning of the Arab conquest. conquest. But oral traditions were long before that a part of the indigenous culture. Halqa was performed in open spaces, the market, or in private homes. My presentation, Halqa, the mother of the theater, emphasizes on the bearer of the stories and fairy tales, whose audiences gather around in a circle, but also that Halqa might be one of the oldest forms of theater in Morocco. Storytelling story theater has been a well established tradition with the Hlaiqi. A Hlaiqi could also act as a messenger and pass on news from neighboring towns or villages. Essentially, a Hlaiqi was considered an entertainer. The entertainment could also be with instruments, singing, and dancing. In some cases, the Hlaiqi were part of a troupe, which together conveyed fairy tales and fables, or stories rooted in real history. Regardless of whether the Hlaiqi performed alone or with others, he or she had an artistic and personal style. My reflections I will share with you come from different Moroccan actors and directors I've spoken with and interviewed. A couple articles I have written as well as information I have gathered from different books and different documentaries. My focus will also be on Marrakesh where my research first began in 2018. One thing my research has taught me, we need to speak to the elders who still remember a past before it's too late. And Morocco's oldest form of theater, as I see it, is on the path of extinction. Of course, the short time given me, we will only be scraping the very tip of the iceberg for examples and explanations of Moroccan theater. My focus will be on Halqa and on the theater play Sharjan Hamman, which I saw in Marrakesh in 2018 as two examples of Moroccan uh, theater. To understand why mod modern Moroccan theater at first glance can be viewed as old fashioned or different, we need the past to understand the present. So let's go back in time to the year 1062. Marrakesh is founded by Yusuf ibn Tashfin, leader of the Moroccan Almoravid Empire. The local storyteller, Hleki, arrives at the square market, Jamal Fna. People flock around him in a circle. They get a story, maybe the sequel from last week or yesterday's, continuation of an episodic series, a continuation that can and cannot end. Halqa can be storytelling, monologue, acrobatics, magic, fortune telling. Halqa can contain poetry, philosophy, lessons and knowledge of anything. Halqa can contain a tragedy or comedy. A halqa can provide answers to a riddle or be told as a riddle. It is told with or without props and costumes. It is told alone or with one or more others. Halqa is theater. The one performing it, the male hleqi or female hleqiya, lives on donations given to them by their audience. It is therefore a profession one is called to do. The Hlaiqi lives for its artistry. It can be passed down from one parent to their child. Now this brings me to Morocco being a diversified country. Many different countries are represented in Morocco. If we trace back different groups, uh, different groups of people's roots, migration, conquest from different times, trading with Europeans and Asians and other Africans, and of course, the slave trade which passed through Morocco. It is very poorly documented. What we know is that during the 15th and 16th centuries, the Portuguese were running a slave trade between Sub-Saharan Africa and the Moroccan port cities. 
during this time, it is generally acknowledged that the largest migration came during the reign of the Sadiyins, the first Arab Sharifian dynasty to rule Morocco. And skipping a lot of history, the point is this. Depending on different ethnic groups and regions in Morocco, a rich culture has always taken place. An example of the diversity of what a halqa can be is the nonverbal way of performing a halqa. Now, if you don't have drums or in instruments or are skilled in stamping with your feet in what is called the clap or the beat of Marrakesh, daqqa marrakshiya, you simply use your hands as an instrument to clap and join in on a performance. Now, I am really skipping a lot more examples. I have hours of footage uh, that shows and really speaks volumes on its own in showing the diversity and richness of Moroccan dance, music, and of course, halqa. And also in different contexts, but I have to skip it all to talk now about the play Sharjan Hman that I saw in Marrakesh at the Royal Theatre by the group Firqat Nujum El Wafa, led by the actor Hajj Ahmed Shima. The play is written by the playwright Abdel Rahim El Khardali. In my reading of the play, I see that it is very loosely based on Ludwig Holberg's Yeppe on the Hill. Several Moroccan plays intertwine the dramaturgical plot of European classical pieces with something recognizable to Moroccans. At first glance, Sharjan Homan seemed simple, but behind the comedic facade and the simple form of the performance, it turns out uh, that the performance had a multifaceted depth. Traditional forms that primarily come from folk rituals she had were incorporated into the play. Many of the theater groups in Morocco tour the country with performances based on a theme. The purpose is to gain awareness to an issue or spread enlightenment and refer to conflicts and solutions that give these performances an educational function we know from European theater in the 18th century. Shazan Hummen, a comedy about the retired veteran Hummen who served during the first Indochina war. Since the end of the war, he has been unemployed and broke. He lives in a Riyadh owned by the Frenchman, Monsieur Jacques, with his wife, Rhea, and her sister, Amel. The sister-in-law, Amel, earns her living as Shikha, a Moroccan traditional singer and dancer who entertains at parties and weddings with her folklore troupe, Shikhaat. The troupe in the play consists of three women and an overly feminine man in the play story. Those who played the Shikha troupe were, in fact, a real folklore troupe that performed on stage. In the play, the folklore troupe not only stayed there to entertain the characters in the play, but stepped out of their role and went on to entertain the audience who now engaged in a call and response. The incorporation of this troupe into Sharjan Hummen led to a social, social happening. The songs and shouts were extended as the audience conti continued to sing the song they knew well, something that the Shikha troupe ac accepted, so did the actors. The folklore group performed as Shikha, continuing the song and performing another. And this went on for a while. The play paused before they went ahead with the play story as written by the playwrights. Her man served in the first Indochina war with his brother. The brother escaped from the war. To give his brother a cover story, Hummen reported him killed in the battlefield. In reality, the brother stayed in Asia, most likely Vietnam, started a family and died of old age. A secret Hummen has kept from his family until one day he receives a letter. Now being illiterate, he is dependent on someone to read and tell him what the letter says. He gets help from his sister-in-law, Amel, who in, turn tell, who in turn tells the secret to the other characters. The secret is that Hummen's nephew in Asia will come to Morocco with $5 billion for investments in the country. This means that both Hummen and the others see their opportunities to earn a fortune. He becomes like Yeppe, the transformed peasant. Her man's greed and, and assumption of getting rich means that he expresses his independence towards Monsieur Jacques. 
and takes a settlement he otherwise would never have taken. Monsieur Jacques ends up throwing out Herman, and the rich nephew, who was to be Herman's rescue, announces his resignation at the very last minute. Herman, like Yaffa, wakes up from his dream. Now, Moroccans were, uh, ag against their will, recruited by the French army to both the First and Second World Wars. During World War II, Moroccans were nicknamed Death Eaters by the Germans due to their sensational strength on the battlefield. From 1946 to 1954, the first Indochina war was fought between the Vietnamese resistance movement, Viet Minh, and France. More than 300,000 Moroccans fought under French rule. It is in this war that the men in the play are said to have served in. That the veterans in Morocco are poor as Herman in the play is a well-known fact. During the reign of Morocco's le uh, late King Hassan II, a pension agreement was negotiated for Moroccan veterans. The catch was that they had to live and stay in France. Then there were those who were missing in action or faked their own death for a new life in an Asian country, just like Herman's brother in the play. With the pension agreement with France, and the insurance of no retroactive punishment for deserting the French military, many descendants of Moroccan veterans in Asia were in fact reunited with their families. Hummen's wife, Rqiya, wears the pants in the relationship and demands that Hummen finds a way to make a living. The couple's dynamics were similar to Mother Osa and Yeppe, where Hummen is also terrified of his wife and her hard blows. Her man is possibly also an alcoholic like Yeppe, without this being said explicitly. Due to alcohol taboo in the country, and especially in the conservative Marrakesh, and the fact that the play was a family show, it is rather her man's smoking and laziness that Rakia is most annoyed by. From a Moroccan perspective, the adult audience will read between the lines and understand that the what the dialogues are really about. It is also a way of saying something by meaning something else, like an allegory, without breaking the boundaries of freedom of expression and at the same time keeping the performance family friendly. What in Moroccan Arabic uh, Darija is called Ma'ani, something citizens of Marrakesh are very famous to be experts on. When it comes to theater of resistance, when ritual practices met with European theater influence, it was with a form of protest. The hybrid form of contemporary theater in Morocco is the result of precisely a resistant movement against the French and Europeans. The Moroccans have taken on something in the center. It is not the history of the Europeans, it is the Moroccan. Allegories of the European classic, be, be it uh, Holberg, Molière, or Ibsen, the European theater transformed into Moroccan theater, deals with Moroccan suffering the European has inflicted on them throughout history, packed with historical layers and symbolic layers. You have to know your Moroccan history. You have to understand Mani, the Moroccan and very complex subtext in the language. I think you can go out with a number of riddles, Mani's, in your lap after a performance. The key to understand a play lies in solving these puzzles. As I said in the beginning, a halqa can be performed as a riddle. To put it in perspective, it took me some months to discover all of these layers of explanations about the play Charge and Roman was packed with. How we know theater from a European perspective is a new phenomenon that gained a foothold in Morocco and among Moroccans as late as the 1960s, after the country's in independence in 1956. Hajj Ahmed Shiba told me, an actor and elder who has grown up in tandem with the rise of the, of the modern Moroccan theater. Among the oldest uh, theater troops, they are seen preserving the folklore tradition by implementing them in their play. The pieces are loosely based on European classical pieces, told from a Moroccan perspective about the social problems that date back to colonial times. And as I see it, Moroccan theater is consistent of cultural preservation for, 
for uh, uh, performative tradition, pr traditional expressions, enlightenment theater, and finally as an art form. Morocco's history is marked by invasions and colonization from the last part of the Stone Age, Neolithic period, to its independence from France in 1956. The performative traditions have always been a way for the local Moroccans to cultivate their identity. The foreigners did not regard Moroccan rituals and storytelling tradi tra traditions as theater. It's thanks to performance study that the ritual traditions were considered somewhat performative. Now, when it comes to political figure, there are also examples of the Hlaiqi uh, in Halqa being consi considered a threat to the Romans during the Roman Empire or the Arabs or the French imperialists. During each invasion, the Hlaiqi was stopped as satire and proclamatory speeches at the expense of local rulers gave them greater popularity among the locals. The Hlaiqi had an entertaining as well as a political role that speaks and narrates. The phenomena Ma'ani arose in everyday speech to partly entertain and at the same time confuse the listener. A linguistic shield disguised as a weapon. The phenomena is linguistically complicated and distinctive of Tarija. The complexity of the language together with the rhetorical ability to the Hlaiqi made him at times an almost political speaker. In the linguistic exchange of codes, a collective unity also arose, and us against them. Hlaiqi became the whom the people went to hear comforting stories about the protagonist who overcomes adversity. In some cases, the stories were deliberately constructed with, with encouragement to the population about what they should do during the resistant movements. Yes, in plural. Codes and messages would also be passed from, for example, she had songs, much like the songs during the slavery in the US. Moroccan theater is both compromising and resisting at the same time. The more I studied the Halka, the more it reminded me of the Polish director and actor Jerzy Grotowski's Poor Theater. Grotowski coined the term poor theater, defining a performance style that rid itself of the excesses of theater, such as lavish costumes and detailed sets, hence being called poor. But if I tweak Grotowski's pieces uh, and say, Halka, pieces center on the skill of the Hlaiqi and are often performed with only a handful of props. As a halqa, the Hlaiqi perform works in spaces such as in the open space market, buildings and rooms. Typically, the audience was placed on many sides of the action, creating a circle or in and amongst the action itself. Storytelling in the style of halqa places emphasis on the physical skill of the performer and uses props for transformation into other objects, sometimes of great significance. Today, the Hlaiqi is recognized as one of the great starting points of Moroccan theater and significant entrance of the experimental, experimental theater movement. Halqa can be performed in any bare space, so performers with few resources often find this style of theater attractive. Halqa is the origin of what Grotowski called the poor theater. He also described it to be a pure theater. The very essence of Grotowski's description of the poor theater, I read as Moroccan or African. Halka is not characteristic to only Morocco. I am only focusing on a Moroccan perspective. It is another African ancient tradition a European has coined and claimed to be revolutionary or innovative after it was ridiculed and viewed as the exact opposite by the Europeans on African lands. Now, I often read that theater did not exist in Morocco prior to colonization. Now, I need everyone to really understand 
this in order to decolonize the view a lot of theater scholars have, including Moroccans, that there was no theater tradition in Morocco prior to the colonization of Morocco and the rest of the African continent. It has also been a personal process of mine to say, to kind of coin back Rutovsky's poor theater and say, Halqa, the mother of the theater, the purest form of theater, is the oldest form of theater in Morocco. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, uh, Rania. Very interesting uh, also. Uh, Connected to what I said about Rutovsky, that's very, very good. Uh, so it fits in. Eh bien, on va uh, on va passer le mot à Christian et Tongo. Donc, j'ai déjà présenté uh, vraiment uh, à la traduction. Christian, est-ce que tu es prêt à donner ton discours uh, maintenant? Ici, oui. Je, je, je te oui, invite à commencer. Est-ce que tu peux m'entendre? Oh, ok, c'est bon. Oui. C'est bon, et tu as entendu ce que je disais, je t'ai invité à faire ta présentation. Et... Oui, j'ai entendu. Bien, euh, je m'appelle Christian Etongo, euh, je suis artiste du Cameroun, euh, je fais des performances depuis euh, 1997, euh, je travaille sur le rituel. Euh, de purification. Le, ma, la base de mon travail, c'est des rituels, de, de, des rituels africains, des rituels du Cameroun. Et je travaille spécialement sur un rituel qui est un rituel de purification au Cameroun qu'on appelle le Tso, qui est un rituel euh, qu'on pratique quand il y a eu un crime, quand il y a eu euh, l'inceste, quand il y a eu euh, un accident, une noyade. Donc, euh, c'est un crime, c'est un rituel pour purifier euh, la communauté. C'est un rituel de pardon, c'est un rituel de réconciliation. Donc, euh, j'utilise ce rituel pour travailler parce que je pense que les, les humains dans le monde entier devraient euh, se, se comprendre, c'est-à-dire euh, euh, parler d'une même langue, parler d'un même langage, euh, éviter les guerres comme euh, en ce moment euh, voilà voilà et puis euh, le fait que je travaille sur la colonisation a fait que j'ai transposé ces rituels de purification sur la colonisation parce que pour moi pour partir de la colonisation pour partir de, 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 de euh, pour décoloniser les mentalités décoloniser nos pays il faut absolument qui est ce rituel. Et ce rituel, pour, comment est-ce qu'on le pratique Le bourreau euh, doit, demande pardon et la victime a l'obligation de pardonner. C'est ça le, le principe du rituel Tso. Donc, on doit redéfinir les, les relations entre l'Occident et l'Afrique. Donc, pour moi, euh, le tout n'est pas de demander qu'on fasse la réconciliation. Le tout n'est pas de demander qu'il euh, qu y ait cette purification, mais il faut déjà accepter, parce qu'il y a un déni. Il y a certains, certains pays occidentaux encore qui refusent, qui n'acceptent pas que la colonisation était une très mauvaise chose pour les Africains. Il y a euh, un problème comme le problème de l'esclavage. Euh, pendant, quand j'étais jeune artiste, on nous a dit que ce n'était pas bien de travailler sur l'esclavage parce que c'était quelque chose qui est passé et il ne faut pas penser à ça. Il faut avancer, il faut chercher l'avenir, il faut travailler sur de, sur de nouvelles choses. Et quand moi, je, 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 en tant qu'artiste qui a de l'expérience, je constate que la plupart des peuples parlent de leur passé sans avoir honte, sans être gênés, sans, euh, sans, sans être embarrassé. Donc, tout le monde devrait parler de, de son passé. Et parlant de notre passé, nous devons euh, parler de ce passé pour redéfinir le présent, pour redéfinir le futur, pour que nos enfants sachent ce qui s'est passé, pour que nos enfants sachent comment se comporter, que ce ne soit pas une surprise. Donc, pour moi, 
euh, j'ai donc fait une performance euh, que j'appelle « After Tears », qui est une performance euh, euh, où je dis après, après la guerre, après la haine, après les pleurs, qu'est-ce qu'il faut Cette performance a été créée à plein euh, pour la, les 130 ans de la commémoration de, 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 de la conférence de Berlin. Donc, il y a eu beaucoup de manifestations, beaucoup d'événements à Berlin en 2015, j'ai donc fait partie euh, de, 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 des artistes qu'on a invités euh, pour euh, faire des performances dans, cette, euh, dans cet événement. J'ai été invité par la Volksbühne, qui est l'un des plus vieux théâtres en Allemagne. Et euh, j'ai donc créé cette performance euh, que j'appelle « After Tears ». Et euh, cette performance a été jouée ailleurs, euh, en Allemagne, euh, en Afrique du Sud, au Cameroun, au Bénin. Et cette performance, c'est une performance que je, 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 je montre le rituel, c'est-à-dire, je, 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 c'est un rituel, il faut dire que le rituel Tso est un rituel qui ne se montre pas en public. Mais moi, j'ai pris la responsabilité de prendre des éléments dans ce rituel pour montrer euh, au public ce qu'on doit faire pour, re, pour se réconcilier et pour qu'il y ait, euh, pour que le sang soit lavé. Parce que pour moi, il faut d'abord laver le sang, il faut d'abord laver le péché, il faut d'abord laver les fautes, il faut laver la haine, il faut laver la colère, il faut laver les rancunes, les rancœurs, pour qu'on avance. Sinon, il y aura toujours une relation de suspicion entre l'Occident et l'Afrique. Donc, j'utilise dans ce rituel parce que je pense que... Et, et, et aussi, j'utilise ce rituel parce que c'est un rituel qui a été interdit par l'Église, par l'Église catholique. Le rituel Tso a été interdit parce qu'il est considéré comme de la sorcellerie, il est considéré comme un rituel maléfique. Alors, comment vous ne pouvez pas expliquer qu'un rituel qu'on pratique pour faire de, de la réconciliation, pour établir l'amour, la confiance, et qu'on vous dise que ce rituel est un mauvais rituel parce que c'est un rituel de sorcellerie. Donc moi, je, je réhabilite ce, 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 ce rituel et il, est, il, est, il faut que je dise que le, ce rituel, quand je le fais, il n'est pas bien vu par la communauté africaine, il n'est pas bien vu par les Camerounais parce que euh, ils sont... Euh, euh, ils sont ancrés dans la, 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 la religion et pour eux, c'est mauvais de faire ce rituel. Alors, c'est paradoxal parce que euh, quand j'exerce je, je, le rituel Tso, euh, les Africains, les Camerounais me disent « Oh, ben, c'est pas bien parce que l'Église interdit ça, mais peut-être que ça va intéresser les Européens. » Et quand je, je, je fais ce rituel en Europe, à, les Européens pensent que c'est quelque chose que je fais, euh, c'est africain, c'est normal que je le fasse et que c'est bien vu chez moi. Donc, moi, de, 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 ce que j'essaye de faire, c'est de, de montrer qu'avec les rituels qui, sont, qui ont été interdits ou qui sont morts, nous pouvons réveiller la paix, la réconciliation, nous pouvons recommencer de nouvelles bases et avoir de nouvelles, un nouveau deal. Parce que pour moi, l'Afrique, l'Afrique est le, 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 le nouveau projet. L'Afrique est le, 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 le nouvel endroit où euh, les autres devraient venir s'inspirer de la culturalité, de l'économie, de la politique. Donc, il est normal que les artistes africains, les, les intellectuels africains, recommence, réhabilite euh, tous ces rituels qui, sont, qui, qui, ont, qui ont été perdus. Voilà, nous revenons un peu sur, euh, 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 en parlant de rituels, en parlant de religion, de la spiritualité, nous revenons sur un, un phénomène qui se passe aujourd'hui qu'on appelle la restitution des objets, des artefacts. Voilà quelque chose qui, qui pour moi aussi, qui est comme euh, une distraction parce que il y a beaucoup de choses à réhabiliter d'abord en Afrique, il y a beaucoup de choses 
à réconcilier entre les Africains parce que à cause de la colonisation, nous avons des frontières, nous avons euh, n'avons pas une monnaie unique, c'est-à-dire la, la monnaie que j'utilise en tant que francophone au Cameroun, ce n'est pas la même monnaie euh, qu'on utilise au Sénégal. Mais toutes les deux monnaies sont le franc CFA. Mais ce n'est pas la même monnaie. Donc, je ne peux pas utiliser mon, mon, mon biais à Dakar. Et à Dakar, il ne peut pas utiliser son biais à, à Brazzaville. Donc, voilà, voilà quelque chose qui est, qui est ridicule. Je pense que nous devons revenir sur tous ces points, les frontières. Euh, en, en Europe, nous avons vu avec l'Union européenne, euh, les frontières ont été... Euh, ont été euh, 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 levés, il n'y a plus de frontières. Mais en Afrique, nous avons des frontières. Et ces frontières sont des frontières coloniales. Le Gabon, le Cameroun, euh, la Guinée équatoriale, nous parlons la même langue, le FAN, mais nous avons des frontières où il faut avoir un visa pour se rendre dans l'autre pays. Donc, je pense que tout ça devrait... Euh, nous interpeller, nous les Africains, ça devrait nous interpeller pour que nous nous unissons, pour que nous là-dessus, pour décoloniser d'abord nos mentalités, décoloniser nos, 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 notre façon de voir les choses, notre façon de faire les choses, et relaver pour redéfinir nos relations avec les autres. Accepter, euh, euh, il faut déjà que les autres acceptent, qu'il y a eu quelque chose. Par exemple, nous avons un souci en, euh, au Cameroun. Un pays comme la France euh, nie la guerre des années 70 au Cameroun qui a coûté la vie à 700 000 Camerounais. Et nous avons par exemple cette guerre qui n'est pas reconnue par la France, cette guerre qui, euh, qui est considérée comme oubliée. Donc, voilà des, des, des choses que ce rituel, le rituel dont je parle, devrait réhabiliter. Ce rituel devrait reparler des guerres oubliées, des hommes qui ont été assassinés pour la liberté, des personnes qui ont été euh, 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 tuées parce qu'ils ont voulu euh, 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 remettre l'Afrique à l'Afrique sa dignité. Donc voilà euh, mon intervention à peu près sur... Euh, euh, le rituel et, et la performance, euh, je pense que en tant qu'artiste, euh, la, la spiritualité euh, dans le rituel que je pratique euh, est en train, pour moi, euh, euh, est la, la source d'inspiration euh, principale pour pouvoir parler des mots de ce monde, pour pouvoir parler de ce qui se passe, pour pouvoir voir les choses euh, autrement, en, 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 pas comme euh, un, un citoyen ordinaire, mais comme un artiste qui a un regard profond, un regard mystique, un regard spirituel sur la marche du monde. Donc voilà, euh, pour moi, c'est voilà l'intervention que j'avais à dire aujourd'hui. Euh, et pour finir, euh, d'abord, je suis euh, content de participer à cette, euh, cette rencontre et euh, aussi de partager avec Rania cette, cette expérience parce que euh, 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 il est important euh, que les artistes disent ce qu'ils ont à dire il est important que au delà de, 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 de ce que nous montrons aux gens euh, comme création il faut que nous parlons aussi aux gens pour leur dire ce que nous avons à l'intérieur de nous et c'est comme ça que nous allons éveiller tout ce qui euh, nous regarde, tout ce qui nous écoute merci oui, merci Christian, c'est très intéressant de t'écouter. Et euh, on va ouvrir euh, peut-être euh, pour les questions euh, ou des commentaires ailleurs. Euh, moi, j'ai une question, mais je vais laisser le mot, euh, par exemple, à d'autres. Euh, Radia ou Herbert, euh, est-ce que vous avez quelque chose à dire euh, euh, à la fin On a sept minutes. Euh, uh, de faire, de faire, um... I have, I do have a comment on uh, uh, Christian's uh, uh, speech when it comes to les rituels en uh, When it comes to to um, ritual, um, I, I mentioned that there were the slave trades that passed through Morocco. 
What happened was also that um, uh, Africans were enslaved and some groups uh, were also then held captives in the different palaces of different sultans, which also meant that a, a um, artistic and ritual uh, practice, which today is called Gnawa, which also has this spiritual um, practice. practice. And, and the same thing, it also became viewed as antardi because it also, the spiritualism would also then invite uh, uh, what is in Moroccan called mluks also, which means uh, uh, spirits or ghosts. Uh, but what Morocco has done to kind of mainstream Gnawa and, and preserve this cultural uh, practice uh, they have done a, a, a very active um, history or cultural memory preservation and in trying to to kind of translate and and explain to the Moroccans the rich richness of this practice. And today it's it's kind of very much mainstream. And, and now it's more, it's, you have a lot of Gnawa um, festivals in Morocco, and it's also gone very mainstream in the fact it's gone internationally as well. But what we know when it comes to the Gnawa um, uh, tradition is that it did in fact come from the other African countries. And, and because they then now were against their will settled in Morocco, uh, the different African groups um, who who participated in Gnawa, um, it was very much reserved. So it was only within the family. For an outsider to be invited in, you really had to gain the uh, the understanding of this ritual. But what is not nice now is that you can say that even it was a ritual interdit. Now it is not. Now it, this understanding, but of course one needs resources and a lot of um, uh, explanation to then understand the values of these ancient traditions, which I am very much also um, uh, uh, trying to kind of explain further when also when it comes to the ancient uh, theater performances that you have in Africa from way back. Thank you. Well, interesting. Thank you, uh, Rania, for a nice comment. Is it to uh, comment here? For a comment here, I'll say that Rania did, uh, Christian. Oui, je pense que nous avons uh, uh, pratiquement les, les, la même uh, le, la même histoire, c'est-à-dire une histoire similaire, j'allais dire, pas la même histoire. Nous avons des histoires similaires uh, en ce qui concerne uh, nos, 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 nos coutumes. Parce que euh, je pense que la force d'un peuple, la force d'un peuple, c'est sa langue, la force d'un peuple, c'est sa culture, la force d'un peuple, c'est sa spiritualité. Donc, si euh, on interdit, si, on, si on, on, on refuse à un peuple de parler sa langue, à un peuple de, 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 de faire sa culture ou de pratiquer sa spiritualité, ça veut dire qu'on veut tuer ce peuple. Donc, pour moi, je pense qu'il est, il est, il est très important. Par exemple, le rituel dont parle le Rania, euh, l'Inawa, qui, euh, je, je connais ce rituel au Maroc, euh, c'est un rituel qui est mal vu. Même, à je pense, à l'extérieur, quand on parle de ce rituel, on parle d'un rituel euh, satanique, maléfique, un rituel de, 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 de trans, où on tape de tambour, Et les gens entrent en France, donc c'est pas bien vu. C'est pas. Je pense que c'est une histoire qui est qui est créée pour pouvoir faire peur aux gens eux-mêmes. Donc euh, il est important aujourd'hui de le savoir. Il est important aujourd'hui de, de 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 revenir en arrière sur ce que nous avons nous avons à faire pour avancer. Donc, je suis d'accord avec euh, Rania. Voilà. Mm -hmm. Oui, merci. Uh, très intéressant. Uh, ma, ma question, uh, ça. Ça, ça peut se connecter à ce que tu as dit maintenant. Euh, euh, Rania a dit euh, euh, le rituel qui, qui, 
qui, qui sont dits de, de faire peur. Mais si on, si on dirige, dirige le regard vers Groenland, il y a le, la danse de masques euh, qui était très surprenante aux enfants qu'ils qu pouvaient survivre dans l'Arctique. La, euh, donc, c'est euh, une espèce de, 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 de pédagogie. Mais ça, c'est une ressemblance qui ne soit nécessairement très relevante ici, mais, euh, mais ça me mène à ça que je voulais te dire euh, au début, euh, tes expériences avec euh, le secteur de, de, de Groenland, quand tu étais à Copenhague avec cette workshop euh, organisée par euh, Hendrik Westergaard Pedersen. Est-ce que tu peux dire quelque chose, euh, seulement très brièvement, euh, au-dessus de ces expériences euh, euh, avec le secteur de Groenland pour que nous euh, fassions cette, cette connexion <rire> nord-sud. Oui, euh, euh, j'ai travaillé avec Jesse Kliman. Jesse Kliman euh, qui est euh, du Groenland et qui, euh, qui est très, très, très en, euh, vraiment euh, concentré dans sa culture et dans sa spiritualité. Donc, euh, nous avons... Euh, malheureusement, euh, nous n'avons pas pu avoir le financement pour travailler sur, entre l'Afrique et le Groenland, mais nous avons pu réaliser à Copenhague une performance sur les musiques euh, mystiques, les musiques mystiques euh, inuites, du peuple inuit, qui ressemblent à des musiques euh, de la forêt au Cameroun. Oh, Donc, oui. Ah, ah oui, très intéressant. Très intéressant. Oui, euh, des, des musiques similaires. Euh, des chants, des chants mystiques des, des, des Hollandes qui ressemblaient à des chants mystiques de la forêt euh, au Cameroun. Donc, euh, nous avons développé une performance qui parlait justement de la réhabilitation de nos rituels, de notre spiritualité. Et, et c'était une performance euh, 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 collective où nous n'avions pas besoin d'expliquer de, ce que nous faisions parce que euh, nous, nous, nous avions la même histoire dans l'histoire de la colonisation de, du Groenland par le Danemark et par l'histoire de la colonisation de la France par le Cameroun. Donc, nous avons même souffrance, nous avions, euh, j'ai apporté, euh, elle a apporté des masques et moi j'ai apporté des, des objets d'Afrique. Nous avons travaillé ensemble d'une manière euh, 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 naturelle, c'est-à-dire nous n'avons pas fait quelque chose, nous avons travaillé d'une manière naturelle. Et pour moi, c'était une très belle expérience de travailler avec euh, Jesse Kleeman euh, qui vient du Groenland. Donc, nous pensons que ce genre de projet doivent euh, se répéter pour qu'il y ait une connexion nord-sud. Mm -hmm. Voilà. Très bien, très bien. Merci Christian, c'était très, très intéressant.